Okay, is everyone able to see the presentation? <laughs> Did I at least put it on the right screen? I, I can see it. So, I, I have a question. I was just implementing part of this um, quick ship was uh, um, when you ship internationally, you need the fair market value in part to be populated, um, especially when the sales order is zero. So when you're doing an RMA and the sales order has a zero dollar amount, it relies on that field uh, for the um, international shipment documents. And what I was trying to do, or what I discussed with sales, is uh, to take the, because there is no standard pricing for the parts, like from one customer to the next, or even, you know, from um, um, between when customers order, because the different quantities and everything, what they wanted to do was just take the last time they saved the part within the sales order, take that price and put it into the fair market value. When I did that through using a business object, it seems to take longer than I would have liked to do that. Take the doc unit price from the order line, order detail, and use the business object to update the fair market value. And just uh, it's like a half a second or longer, or the minimal I see was like a quarter of a second. So Calvin or Fred, I don't know if you had any ideas. Is that pretty normal? The only thing I've seen, yeah, the RESTful services are much quicker in 10.2, 400, and 500 than the business object. So I know a lot of people are moving their stuff over towards that. Yeah, and you see, it can, you can use RESTful services in, uh, in a data directive or method directive. In 10.2.500, you can, I believe. Then you'll have the Epicor functions, but before that, not you can, but you'll be jumping through hoops. Okay. We're currently on 400. Oh, I just have to say it. You should upgrade. It was Sorry, a pretty big task. <laughs> It was a pretty big task, and I, I haven't even upgraded <laughs> once in August, and so um, I, I need to upgrade at least 400, definitely, to fix several things. But uh, going to 500, trying to get people to test anything. So 400, my thing is, hey, it's in pilot. Do your testing. If you find a showstopper, let me know. If you didn't do your testing, we're going live in two weeks, unless you tell me. <laughs> well, going to 500, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to say, do your due diligence. <laughs> And then you tell them at the, as much as uh, you want to, you tell them at the end, kind of, sort of, that, you know, it's your fault if you didn't test. So don't make it my urgency if we went live with 500 and you didn't do your job because you can't test everything for them. Exactly. Well, I, uh, we went from 10 0, 700 to 10 to 400 and that went, I think, a lot smoother than, um, than I anticipated for certain. Of course, I was brand new to Epicor too, to, uh, about six months in. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that there were really just, there was nothing super major. And now that I think I understand most everything, it sh I think it should be far easier just to jump to 500. I could almost do the same thing. You have two weeks, if not, we're going live. <laughs> May make it two months. So I'm a huge advocate for testing. So <laughs> my testing and yours may look very different. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I let them come up with their own testing. You know, part of the prep for this was to for them to come up with the test scripts, and then you know I was like, okay, here's the test scripts you came up. So some people did did it, some people didn't. You know, they could adjust right. it or whatever they want. Um, it does sometimes help to guide them towards what they should be testing to. Uh, because it's easy to do the regular positive test that, yep, 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 this works. It's 
where are you going to run into issues the stuff that happens monthly quarterly yearly and it's going to be the things that um that breaks or that they do so infrequent and they need to write those things down to get those negative tests on some of that too you got to try break the thing <clears throat> yeah well our accounting finance department i think they're one of the ones that uh did some of the better testing once they finally tested but so going from 400 to 500 you're going to be really safe there weren't a lot of changes that really broke infrastructure or customization so yeah it was really fixes to the erp i agree well i mean i agree that it, it probably won't break anything from what i could see or not see but from what i could uh tell or I don't know. Well, I was just getting a sense. <laughs> yeah. We'll get our, our, our 500 test environment up and running and let you know. Be good to know. Every one of us operates so differently, right? And we use such a different part of the of Epicor's system. And so it's hard to say sometimes whether... It might run smooth for 10, 25 customers, and then you have all the problems because you're doing things so differently, potentially. Yeah. I'm curious to what other people are doing when they're doing their testing, if anybody wants to share that while we're kind of chit-chatting here right now for a little bit. We got our first client that came to me and said, oh, yeah, we really liked Epicor for their financials we didn't buy any of the other modules we only got arap and gl well and it was like i don't think i've ever run across this in 25 years and then they told me there are over 100 companies also so they bought the multi-company and i'm like what <laughs> that was interesting wow. their testing was thoroughly documented screen prints images work instructions doing their upgrade and their uh implementations on the next versions was super simple because it was so thoroughly documented when we went to go from version to version it was okay take your work instructions let's update the screen images verify that the instructions are the same and that people can do their work it That's was awesome. a piece yeah, of cake i've never seen someone upgrade with over a hundred companies in two weeks i think you're right testing and documentation is huge Yep, their process was very documented and they followed them to the letter. Now, yeah, it was just the accounting department, but it was really interesting that everything was ironed out for every one of the companies, the consolidations, all the documentation that was done. But that's accounting. That's what they do. <laughs> Anybody's just joining, um, we are just waiting a few minutes. We are, we're a little bit behind our schedule right now, but a few minutes just to give a break from the, some of our other sessions and we should be starting the job full circle session soon. Awesome. Any other questions people are having or thoughts that might have come up during the day that, hey, I'm looking for this answer. Okay, Christine, should I just go ahead and get started? Yep, I'd say let's do it. Awesome. Everybody, I'm Calvin Decker with Code of Bears. I'll be going over jobs full circle today. And by full circle, I mean when the quote gets put in, the engineering gets done, 
these parts are being set up and they're if you're a standard cost we're setting the standard cost then we run the job and we find out what the actual cost was and it may not be what we thought it was going to be financials goes ahead and closes it we update our costing where the reroll standards or we update our average cost automatically with epicor Either way, are we taking that full circle and giving it to the quoter or the engineer and saying, hey, you thought this operation was going to take 200 hours. It took us 400. You are nowhere near correct in getting the engineering or the quoting updated so that they learn either from the mistake or where their win was. You may have turned around and said, hey, we did great on this. We thought it was going to take 200 hours. It took us 20. Awesome. You quoted, you estimated, you ended up earning a profit on this. But if we don't take the jobs back to the beginning, people have no clue what's going on. And that's what today's discussion is going to be, is taking jobs full circle. So the definition of an insanity, everybody knows this one from Albert Einstein, looking for different results. If I don't take that engineering info back to the estimator or the quoter, and I'm going to make that job again, you're going to make the same mistakes. Um, and how do you compare the data? There are analysis codes inside the software. People have seen the fields. I'm, when I'm out in the client workplaces, I see, oh, yeah, we have that field. We have no clue what it is or how to use it. Header analysis, material analysis. I may not know all the details when I put the quote together, but I can lump the areas together by those analysis codes and then compare. These were my milestone analysis codes on the quote. This is what they were on the job. How did I compare? You may not be able to say it was material 10 on the quote. It's all to material 10 on the job. Compare the two together. By using the analysis codes, you can do that. Um, there are also analysis codes for operations. So all the major areas of the job and the operations and materials, we can compare those between the job and the quote, but we need to get that information back to either the design engineering team or the quoters that, hey, this is what we were told how to do it. We put this in, now we find out it did, went nothing like that. If we don't correct the analysis people, or I'm sorry, the quoting people or the engineers, they're going to make the same mistake over and over again. Um, there are also planners, teams, and job codes, and these can be placed within the bill of materials or on the job so that I can turn around and say, give me all of the stuff that planner A released to the floor. Are these way out of whack? Can I analyze this data with BI? We talked about it earlier today, but if I can see the jobs by planners or by the teams that are working them or the job codes, can I see a pattern where this person is missing this part? Now I can go ahead and correct it. If I'm not even using the field, there's no way we can analyze it when it comes down the line. So getting this set up in Epicor so that we can actually take the jobs all the way from quotes and then feed them back into quoting or into engineering is what this is all about. And that's the full circle I'm referring to. We need to go that extra mile within Epicor. By using this data, we can now look at how did my job receipts happen? How did my costing method get impacted or affected by doing this? Should I switch over from standard to average or vice versa? These are not simple things to be done in the software, but they are something that you should be looking at based on what's going on. If your job costs are completely out of whack every time you run the job, I wouldn't advise average costing. Your part prices are going to be all over the board. Your part costs are going to be all over the board. 
This is why we need to make sure that these analysis codes, the job codes, the planners, and the teams are being utilized between the quote and the job so that we can make sure we can compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. If we don't even categorize them, we'll never be able to link the two back together. Um, again, why stop now? Job receipts, when I receive it to inventory, when I ship it to a customer, this is the only time that average cost gets updated. This is when I turn around and impact what's going off to variances. When the products leave by that job receipt from work and process into either inventory or a customer shipment is when the dollars are being captured. This is what we want to compare it against when we th think of what was our quoted price or what was our estimated bill of material price. I know uh, someone had asked a question earlier about getting the bomb cost out of CAD. The same thing, the bomb cost report does exist in Epicor. So if you push it in and you run the bomb cost report and it shows you what your complete price is going to be to make it, are you taking your job and comparing that back to what you estimated the cost was? All of this is going to impact Epicor, whether your average cost, standard cost, yeah, FIFO average is definitely going to be hit, or last cost. Your costs are going to be going all over the place if we're not running the same thing. If you're running the same job or the same product and you're making it 100, 1,000 times, you should have your standards set. You should have the cost and understand what's going on here. It's a repeat every time we do it. If you're a custom manufacturer, as many Epicor users are, we need to make sure that what we estimated and what we ran come back together and make sure that we're tracking what those costs are. Next one, everyone is getting production detail reports. I doubt if anybody is running these. A lot of customers I walk into, they print it because they were told to do it during their implementation and it goes in a file and never gets reviewed. You need to look at these production detail reports. The manufacturing receipts are the numbers correct. If the labor is not issued to the job, if the materials weren't issued to the job, the subcontract price wasn't specified in that unit cost, where did these costs end up going? And when they did do the receipt for manufacturing, all of that skewed what the receipt price was. So was setup tracked, was production tracked, was everything put in before that receipt from manufacturing took place or the shipment to the customer. Material transactions, if I estimated we needed five sheets of material, did we issue the five sheets of material to the job? Um, was it returned? I also have clients that I walk into and I see, oh yeah, we issued 20,000 pounds of steel to the job. We threw those bars at it. Um, but they only used 15,000. The other 5,000 never came off of the machine and went back into inventory. So they ended up overcosting the materials that were put into the job. Um, same thing with subcontract. There is a very poor visibility in Epicor. I can create a subcontract operation. I have to route 100 parts through it. When I receive that product back in, if I only get 98 pieces back in, there are two that are now missing. If the user doesn't receive the 100 and non-conform the other two or scrap the other two at that point, now all the costs of the job are going into the 98 pieces, but what happened to the other two? They disappear. Did we reconcile that everything that we sent out even came back from the subcontract vendor? Or do we just allow the vendor to send us product and we don't really track it? You know, we send them so many, they'll send it back. It's very difficult to do because on a receiver, the receipt entry person has no clue if they're going to get another batch of parts back from heat treating or from anodizing. They just enter the quantity that they receive. 
giving them visibility is as simple as writing a BAQ to show what was the total product shipped out when they're entering the receiver. I can display that BAQ in a BAQ zone on the receipt entry screen to show them a little grid of this is how many parts went out to the vendor and this is what came back. Is this the case where we're only getting 98 parts out of 100? Maybe we need to call the subcontract vendor and say, hey, where's my other two pieces? Um, and then making sure that we can reconcile that financially in there. The same thing with quality. If those two parts didn't come back, did it go through the vendor process? Did we do a nonconformance? Did we do a DMR? Did we account for all the parts that were in the process that we started with? All of this has to be done. Your production detail report will show this. It's just very difficult and cumbersome to look at. Now that it's gone over to an SSRS report, I've seen a lot of people start putting highlighting on the fields. If it's within uh, if it's within 5%, but not at 100, highlight it yellow. If it's not within 10%, highlight it red so that they can see the errors immediately when they look at these reports and make sure that, okay, what happened to our parts? Why did we overissue material? Where's the labor on this? I've also seen people where they turn around and run um, two people in a work cell and both report the quantity produced. Now I've got a double quantity created. Could be just as simple as user training, but highlighting the production detail so that this sticks out and shines is something people should be looking at and making sure that what they thought they were making is truly what happened out of there. Um, Bruce put a comment out, recommended looking at the job status dashboard. Um, it's a right click away from inside there. This is another way to do that. That job status dashboard is based on a BAQ. You could use Epicor's BAQ in a BAQ zone. So you don't even have to make anything. You just have to link their query to show while you're on that receipt entry screen. Um, same thing, employee efficiency needs to be looked at. If the operator was supposed to be making 100 parts per hour and they only made 10, we need to find out what that problem is because this job is theoretically going to take 10 times what we estimated to create those parts. Um, what labor rate was put in there? Um, did I have a setup person that turned around and did all the work of a production person? That production standard definitely needs to be reviewed because that's where engineering and quote estimators often go wrong, I find. What they think can be put through the plant floor is never what the plant floor truly or actually does. Um, this is also a great way to find out if employee training is needed. If a person is constantly running the same job at a very low level of efficiency, do we need to just train this person? Do we need to increase the comments that are in the engineering so that they know, hey, if you put the drill bit in with the tip pointing out, it goes a whole lot better. While we may think it's something that's very simple, same thing, put the staples in the stapler right side up. It may be common sense to us, but it may not be to the employees that are operating the machines. Make sure that we put these comments then in the notes. What can we do to improve the engineering so the next time I run this part, we don't make the same Albert Einstein mistake? Machine and resource efficiency. If the machine was supposed to be running at a certain efficiency level and we're getting nowhere near that, do we need to turn around and change what our resource is doing? Is it not necessarily the operator? It could be the machine that's running slow. We need to take a look at these and then fix it. The engineers, I find, generally look in the books. Well, this is what Davenport says is the cycle speed for this. Their machines hasn't gotten that in 40 years because it's an old legacy machine that's been running since the 50s. 
these have to be updated. They're still using the book to set the standard. That's not what the machines are actually attaining. We need to feed the information of what actually is happening back to the estimators and the engineers so that they're not making that same error. Um, or flat out, does the resource require repair or tuning? Um, it could be as simple as, hey, we need to get an oil change out there. Let's go ahead and schedule it. We're now hitting an average efficiency of 55%. Okay, we got a problem on this machine. Let's get it repaired so that we're back up to it. We're losing money as a company by not doing these things. And the data is there. We're just not looking at it. Next one is machine utilization. Did the resource get used for all the full uh, for the shifts that we have here for open three shifts was this machine only sitting working one shift why was it sitting out there um, do we need to get a robot possibly to put in there instead of an operator we might be cheaper just putting in a mechanical or putting in a solution for this um, could we use multiple resources to shorten a job run rather than run it on one machine for months um, there are only so many hours that we have in a day. Did we maximize what we have to work with? If I can get more parts through my plant floor within the same day, that's the name of the game here. Um, was the production standard attained again per the resource manual? What the quoters and the estimators are using may not be what we're finding on the plant floor. We need to fix that. And this is going to show up in machine utilization. And there are a lot of companies now getting on board with the overall uh, employee efficiency and overall effectiveness. The OEE that's hitting the, everybody wants to integrate their machines directly into Epicor. I want to know, okay, is my machine running at capacity? Am I getting everything or am I getting information from Epicor 10 hours later at the end of the shift? I find out I lost eight hours worth of productivity. They want to know within minutes, is the machine not running? So they're integrating their machines to talk directly back to Epicor and let them know. This is the IoT that's coming out and you'll see a lot more of this in 10 to 500 and 10 to 600. The framework is into Epicor. It's connecting with Azure and it's feeding machine utilization directly back into ERP so that rather than finding out eight hours or 10 hours at the end of the shift, you can now find that out a half an hour into the day that it's not running at the speed that we anticipated. Next one is the part engineering and reviewing the parts job histories. Every time, if I'm a repeat manufacturer, I should be looking at the part job history and say, hey, how did we do over the last 10 times we ran this part? Have we gotten better at it or are we getting worse? Are there problems? Um, did operational standards get updated if we weren't reaching what we thought the speed was? Do we need to go in and fix the part bill operations and update what the new standards are? Labor notes, I generally push it. I'll also recommend it on data collection. When they clock out of a job, they can put their labor notes right in there. And this is where they can put notes of, hey, if I put that drill bit in with the tips pointing out, it works a whole lot better. Put these instructions or put these comments into the operations and feed them back in. If the operators type this into the labor note, it's very easy for someone on the production detail report to highlight the important ones, hand the production detail over to engineering and get the bill of material corrected and updated. Um, scrap and salvage quantities, did these get updated? If every time we issue a 12 foot bar we have a two foot drop okay there's a two foot drop if that's a brass bar that's pretty valuable if it's a steel bar eh, maybe not unless it's a large diameter bar but still we should be looking at the scrap and the salvage and putting that into epicor most systems when i walk in i'll find people aren't even using these they'll leave them blank or oh 
doesn't matter. We just put it in the scrap bin and they take it away. The scrap hauler comes by and picks up our dumpster. Making sure that this is getting captured and credited back to the job. The overall part scrap setting, are these getting updated? Um, all of this data is being captured in the system, but we're not using it to prevent ourselves from making the same mistake the next time we run the part. It's a little more difficult for an uh, engineer to order house that, hey, we don't make the same part, we can't do this. As long as you do the same processes, we can look and make sure that processes are still also correct. It may not be the same thing you're making, but it is the same processes and services that hopefully you're offering because these are the operations that you have in your plant. Next one, were the vendors reviewed for improvement? Um, our material, could it be in more timely? Could we do it just in time by having the material come in as we're running the job? Um, subcontract, were they correct? Did we account for all the pieces? Making sure that all of that information is back into the part engineering. So the next time we run this job, we learn from the same mistakes. I'm not gonna say it's just labor notes and we need to feed and improve ourselves. It's also interacting with the vendors for the raw material and the subcontract operation. So, hey, the next time we do this, we can tell you, this is what we're doing. Tool up and get ready for it. We're gonna be sending it back out to you. Repeat manufacturing, did we improve from that last run? Inside Epicor, if anybody has looked at the part advisor, there's a, have I made this or have I produced this part before? It'll show you every time you've produced it and then also what was your efficiencies and what was your profit on it? Did you improve on this? Were employees running slower? Did we get them trained? Um, I've seen some people that have also said, oh yeah, well, every time this job comes in, it's tribal knowledge. We just let this person do it because they've been here the longest. I'm like, well, can't you turn around and share that with somebody else? And they're like, well, we don't really have the instructions on how to make it. Just this one person knows. That's a danger. Get other people cross-trained. By having more employees trained on it, you're also going to get more feedback from the employees on it ways to improve the process. Um, were materials considered for going under our contract rather than immediate purchase and, hey, expedite that in here, we need it this time. Um, how many people on the phone, I'll just kind of give everybody a second here, use the master production schedules if you own the MRP module? Are you using the master production schedules for your repeat products or sub-assemblies that you just want to keep on the shelf? Or do you just let MRP create the required jobs if it's part of the bomb? Bueller? Awesome, we got Michelle here. <laughs> okay, Michelle doesn't use MRP, no fair. Christine. Hello, what? Sorry. Uh, any information? You guys use MRP over there, don't you? We do use MRP, yes. As far as master production schedules, are you using those yeah, for your sub-assembly? So, no, we... We have a hard time getting anybody to buy in on using master production schedule. So we are not using that. <laughs> We're trying. I see Scott's mentioning they use MRP, but they don't use MPS either. We do have Same one thing. company we want to try it on, but we haven't gotten that yet. Okay, I see a handful of people that have the RMRP module, but they're not using the master production schedules. Um, what I'm looking to do is you can see the inventory that you require. By having MRP turn around and you can analyze the data of how many times did I make that sub-assembly, how many times did I make this component. Consider using 
a master production schedule, especially for you guys, Christine, because I know you're seasonal. Your sub assemblies that are low expense could possibly be created with a master production schedule and put on the shelf during the winter months so that you could use them when they're needed in springtime. All we These know, would be a candidate just, for. We know we just need to get buy-in. <laughs> it's an area in the system that I don't see a lot of people utilizing. And it's a great way to do that. They're using the MRP to manage their supply records. And hey, this is what I need, make a job immediately. Or oops, we got to run a second shift in that department because I got an overload coming up. MRP just sent out all these jobs for it. Master production schedules can also turn around and offload that by looking at when am I not overloaded? When can I run these? Um, for a single piece job, I estimated actual labor um, was estimating updated for that. This, I'm sorry, I estimated labor for a job, but did I actually take what happened on that job and feed it back to the estimators? If they don't learn where they went wrong, they're gonna keep repeating those errors and losing you money. Um, they estimated materials, were they on? Or were they incorrect? Even a single piece job still can turn around and send that back to the front and make sure that they understand where did they go wrong. Was scrap estimated incorrectly? Was subcontract estimated incorrectly? By taking that back to the front, to the quota or the design engineer and saying, hey, you were way off. Even a single piece job, the same way I do a million piece job, if I don't feed that back into the beginning of my pipeline, they're going to keep making the same errors. I know there are a lot of customers. Um, Pete was just talking about shipping and getting orders correct so that when the order goes in, it flows into shipping correctly. If they don't feed that information back, customer service at the front of the line is going to make the same mistake over and over. So he's building solutions so that shipping integrates and feeds that back in. Exact same thing, no difference with the jobs. I just find most customers don't take that job. It's like, hey, we made it. We got it out. We're on time. Consider ourselves lucky. But if you're not doing the full circle analysis on that job and taking it back to the estimator and say, this is where you went wrong. Hey, design engineer, you're a little bit off on what it costs for subcontract you got to feed this back full circle so that they can improve their process as well. Operational analysis, the resource production standards, did we look and are these correct? Did our, were our move-in queue times correct or did that impact our capacity plan? The employee labor records, um, make sure that these are being reviewed, that yes, this is truly how long it took. This is what happened. The operational comments, feeding that back into the front so that those labor notes get back into the part engineering so we don't repeat the same mistake a second time. Um, consider using operational text set up for standardizing some of these things. Um, operational text can be set so that I have a drop down that I can pull standard comments into certain operations that automatically Epicor is going to put in there. Um, were the uh, purchasing comments updated to the material? Hey, don't send me the rusty material. <laughs> May sound bad, but I have a client that turns around, they constantly get timber from a supplier where they sent it and it's warped and uh, wet. That just turns around there like, okay, we'll just replace the supplier. We'll let the supplier know this is a problem and doesn't work for you so that you are getting that corrected. But if the shop floor that's issuing the material doesn't put those comments in there, we're never going to see that or get the purchase order note updated so they don't make that mistake in the future. without having the visibility to see where the errors are, it's going to be super difficult to even take it back and fix the beginning of our own pipeline. 
this is the whole reason you went to Epicor was so that you could tie all these systems together. But if we don't take that job information back to where it started so that they don't make the mistake again, you're not getting the information that you were looking for. You're not improving your processes just even inside the ERP software. You've got to turn around and let the designers understand what truly was uh, attained out on the plant floor. This is what jobs full circle really is all about and making sure do I have the production detail report going back into quoting and estimating and design engineering so that they know, hey, this is what we really did. This is way different than what we thought was in the book. Using those analysis codes is going to be a great way to help because now I can compare and say, okay, this is all my raw materials. This is my sub assemblies. Um, this is my assembly operations. These are my formings. Turn around and group them by areas. And that's where the analysis codes can come in and help out as well. So that even though the jobs bomb is a little different than the quoting bomb, I can still tie them together for the analysis when I go to look at it afterwards. Bringing that information is what I find people are not doing with their jobs. So they're not educating. And the whole reason that we went with an Epicor system or an ERP system is so that it flows properly. It's not just to get it out the door. It should also be to educate the people and fix the process at the beginning. Any questions on it? Who all is having their design engineers and quoters review the production detail report? I should probably say who's using the production detail report for more than profitability and costing. I don't think we do. This is an area you need to hand these reports back over to the front of the line and say, hey, this is what we hit, not what you thought we did. Bruce, what are you finding out there? I don't think Bruce is on anymore. Okay. How about any of you others that are using MRP but are not using, I mean, even if you're not using master production schedule? <clears throat> Scott's saying they're using multiple BAQs and dashboards as alternatives to the production detail report. Michelle's saying that they turn around and run the report, but they're using it more. Their custom jobs are being analyzed. Did they get where they were estimating? Tom's using BAQs. Yeah, we have some SQL, SQL queries that have been written that we show them some information, but from what I learned so far from your presentation, I think we can do even more. Um, I did find one customer, they were using the job closing screen. So they were looking at the operations there, if they were close or not, and they turned around and had us put row rules on the screen so they could see which operations were out of whack, which ones were really out of whack, and same thing for the materials, so that they could find it even before they closed the job. 
I suppose we do something different, similar. We do have our supervisor looking at the job closing, at least to make sure they kind of fall within the line. And we do use an auto close uh, parameter for their jobs. Um, but, and then we have the engineer, engineers, manufacturing engineers go back at some regular time and try to review a trend, if nothing else. But I don't, I think we can still be more detailed. <clears throat> I'll see production people will analyze, oh, did we get all the labor done? Are we within threshold? Yep. Did we get our materials issued? Yep. Inventory is signed off good on this. But then I don't see people turn around and put it back into the quoting or the estimating area to let them know, hey, this is what we're really hitting. Or take a look at this job. How can we improve it? How can we make it cheaper? It's the whole case is to be able to make the product cheaper and do a continuous improvement. We'll have continuous improvement initiatives running just as standardly, or this is part of our lean initiative, or we're going through this, we're going to do continuous improvement. I'm looking at it as a run the continuous improvement through the whole Epicor system as well and make sure that our jobs are feeding back into our quoting. Any other questions? All righty. And where do we stand here? Okay, CAD link. I don't know if they're on phone yet. Nope. I'm not seeing either of them in here. Okay. Open floor for questions or ideas. If you're still on here, has it been helpful today as we're working through going to our last presentation? And what can we do differently? Topics? Hi guys, this is Beth Rye. I just wanted to thank you guys for putting this together. I think it was a great um, day full of a bunch of information. So um, maybe in a short time, I'd like to talk to you, Christine, and talk to you, Calvin, on something that the Michigan Indiana group can do, but it was awesome. So I wanna thank you. Thanks. Like, it's not the same as the Kalamazoo Public Library, but hey, we're a little further apart. <laughs> hey, you know how it is. You know how I roll. <laughs> when I saw your I name know. pop I up, I thought no. about I thought about sending Jimmy Johns over to your area. <laughs> well, if you're going to do that, you have to let me know because... I have to go out in the parking lot to meet the Jimmy John's guy because they're not allowed to come into our lobby, you know. Wow. Coronavirus. <laughs> That'll be the same for us. <clears throat> Don't come to us. We'll come to you. <laughs> well, we appreciate it, Beth, that you've been uh, hanging out with us all day. I know we got Q-Belt still left for the deep dive, but... We had some time, um, and yes, absolutely, we can uh, we can chat um, some more about how we what we're doing and how we're doing things. And normally, our meetings would have had breakout sessions and and such. And obviously, that's not a really good feasible way to do things on a virtual uh, meeting. But we appreciate your feedback.
This was great. I mean, you know, you guys threw it together really quick and it was very timely and good job. Well, we already, yeah. I mean, we were supposed to meet today. Let's get, you know, we had, this was our scheduled meeting for the Iowa user group today. Last week, early last week, uh, it was clear that meeting together at our academy was not going to happen. So then it was like, hmm, what do we do? Do we cancel or do we figure out something else? And the figure out something else became, huh, maybe we can do something virtual. So obviously we had all the presenters and everybody lined up uh, to do something. And everyone was like, yep, let's do it. Let's figure out what a new world look like with virtual stuff. So they, I would like to thank, you know, the people who have been presenting, QBuild and Coda Bears, you know, because they've taken this challenge on too. I'm going to throw the question out to people. Would it have helped to had a go-to meeting for each session? Because there was something Christine and I were talking about. Um, Focus Software was doing a user's workshop today at 2 o'clock, and I'm like, I can send out a go-to meeting, and we can open a session there and kind of share that as well. They're like, you don't necessarily have to be a customer of Focus Software to see how their stuff works and how the open dialogue was going. And that was already an online session. So it was like, if we did multiple go-to meetings, we could also run some of the sessions side by side and still record them. All right. I think there's only thing you, you, you just have more people needing to be moderators of some of this. That would be... Um, Versus today, we just, between us, we checked on up and everything, so. Yeah, I think there's pluses and minuses for running both because you have to have multiple people being able to do it. Um, I know just even like in our live meetings, it's hard enough. Um, I'm facilitator mainly. If you've ever been to one of ours, you know that everybody knows who I am. Um, and I know how difficult it is. Um, and it takes a group of people to be able to, and if you break off, then you have to say, okay, who goes here, who goes there? And are they familiar with how to run things and stuff like that? So I, I thought the format was good. Um, I'm just wondering if you can, on the sessions, if you're gonna send out the recorded sessions, can you break them apart by, you know, from this time to this time. So like, I really yep. want to go back and look at the one on the BAQ and sub queries. That was an awesome session for me because it's something I'm struggling with right now. And I'd love to see it over again, um, especially since I was interrupted during the middle of it. So yep, that's not a problem. Thing. We are going to take the video. We'll break the pieces apart so that people can download the piece that they're looking for, or you can download the whole one with the transcript because in the written transcript you can also click on a link in the transcript and it'll take you to that port of the video so even Kevin, though it's an eight hour you can still click yeah go ahead fred on the transcription the clickable is only if you view the transcription online if you download it as a word document i'm not sure those links are still there oh uh. But you can get the Word document so you've got all the text to read. If you know where you're looking for, then you can kind of scroll to that spot when you look at it online. Um, and then you click on it, and it would take you right to that spot in the video. I think in the transcription, it'll also have a timestamp. Um, so you could just fast forward to that point to grab and, you know what I mean, drag it to that timestamp. Great. I can take I a look. I mean, they've never deleted our recordings on the GoToMeeting portal. So um, we can send the link to everybody and they can access it online too. Yeah, and I think the link, right, I'd have to check. I think those links expire after like 30 or 60 days. Um, so even though we've got the, the videos out there, if they don't, you'd have to reshare it after 30 or 60 days, I've found. Well, I have to hop off, guys, but again, good job. Kudos to you guys. Um, it was awesome. So thank you for the invite. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Beth.
So and I saw your note, Scott. Session. Yeah, Scott's note. He can use this for the uh, Pennsylvania group too. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I hear Coda Beer is willing to travel eventually or do virtuals. <laughs> we do both now, obviously. <laughs> right. Darn, we set a new precedent. That's okay. You know, I, it's all about just being creative and figure out how we can still do things right now. So. Yep. I can also okay. check with Fred if when we break the videos up, if we put them up in a subfolder on the YouTube channel, maybe we can use that as a way to roll them out to everybody so they don't have to download the huge video sections. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can probably get them up on YouTube and we can create a channel for that or something. Yep. Is everyone okay oh, with that? Cuz I'm like we did record it and everybody's on here. I don't know what the legality of putting everybody on the recording is. Those that were speaking, yeah. I'm like I'm not too worried about those where that are in the background is just I don't know what the legalities are. <laughs> Yeah, You're correct. We should probably we can uh, we should probably ask the Q build and Source Day folks if they're okay because that would I think I might be able to mark it as private, but we should get their permission regardless, just in case. If not, we can you know keep it within our group and it's okay. Yeah, you gotta come join us to get the good stuff. <laughs> 